Okay, so um, let us start. So first of all, um, today I'm going to finish um, the part about the um, the DC zero manifold structure of um, Alexander spaces, and uh, then next week, which also happens to be actually spring break, we're going to skip it, and. On the 21st, um, Elia is going to give uh, the next seminar where he starts with the uh, uh, material on Perelman's uh, stability theorem uh, following Kapovich. Okay, so let me make. Yes, so let me make a little summary of the last time. Okay, so first of all, I'm assuming N uh, is an n-dimensional Alexandro space. And let me assume also that it is compact. Okay, then recall that the regular set of M is given by the set of points X, where the tangent cone is isometric to an N, the Euclidean space. And then we have another set, which is maybe we could call, say, M delta. Okay, so these are the set of points X where there is a delta strainer. And recall that for a delta strainer, we have the condition that we have points X. Okay, so here we have points, so two endpoints. So that exists P1, Pn, Pn plus one, P uh, two N. And what we know is that the angle which is formed at the point X by Pi and Pi uh, plus N. Okay, this is bigger or equal than Pi minus delta. And the angle which is formed by Pi X, so Pi uh, X J is bigger or equal than Pi and half minus delta, and that is for every i, which is not equal to j and not equal to m plus j. Okay. So, and if we take delta sufficiently small, this m delta, which is an open set, so m delta is open, and if delta sufficiently small, Then M delta is a Lipschitz manifold. Okay, and we know that the local, local charts are given by function f, which depends on this point x, and these are given exactly by the distance. To the points P. Okay, then what we proved about so so the regular so what we know about the regular set here is that it's going to be the intersection of the M delta as delta goes to zero, and 
These M deltas are open and dense. So this one is a, um, so regular M is a G delta dense set. But in fact, um, if we assume that the space has no, okay, so maybe we should say better. So it is possible to say more. So it is possible to stratify points X. in M and it is possible to stratify depending on the fact that we can write its tangent cone as a product of the Euclidean space with another metric cone. So the top stratum, which is the stratum in which we are regular, um, it's, it's, it's the set of points where the tangent cone is exactly at n times zero. Then there is a second. Then there is a first stratum, which is actually uh, which which corresponds to the boundary of the Alexandro space, which is the points where the tangent cone is going to be half a Euclidean space. And then the next stratum is the set of points where um, the tangent cone is going to be an n minus two uh, dimensional space. Um, Dimensional coordinate time is zero. Yes. Sorry. Two dimensional cone times are n minus. Yes, two. exactly. Two dimensional cone times are n minus two. So what you just said is it the different like the first round? Is it the definition of the boundary or like? What's that, that is the definition of the boundary. So the set of points where you have a half space as a um, a half space as a um, uh, 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 as a tangent cone. Exactly. So maybe the closure of that. So boundary of M is no, I think you okay. So you might that even, you include like order or so. That yeah, okay. So, so let me just say it in the following way. So let's so the, the boundary of M you can define it as the points X where the tangent con is R N plus. And then the next one, which we can call the n, n minus two dimensional stratum, okay, so this is a set of points X where, uh, um, or, or maybe we could say like, you know, less or equal than n minus two dimensional stratum is the points X where uh, the tangent cone is RK, times some m minus k dimensional cone. And this k is um, less or equal than the dimension minus two. OK. And all of this discussion is just to say that if you, for the moment, forget about this boundary over here, so we've assumed that it does not have any boundary. Okay, the next set, which is the n minus two dimensional stratum, um, you can actually hope that this one is n minus two dimensional. And so, except for an n minus two dimensional set, and, and this observation is going to play a key role, this regular set um, is everything else. Okay, so if we work under these assumptions, the theorem of the last week, which can be stated in the following way. So, um, so this is the theorem by Pedelman. Okay, and the theorem by Pedelman says that the um, Manifold structure on M delta can be made. So the manifold structure can 
can be made. DC, and by DC means that so the change of coordinates in the chart in the charts are different of convex functions. Okay, so this can be improved crucially to something which at first looks technical, but which we will see play a very important role to define the calculus. Sorry. How would we include in those charts the points uh, that are like just I mentioned? That are codes so, of like I'm trying to understand how to think about this data where like we have this. So that is that so it's it's okay. So I'm not claiming I'm not claiming that this because this object is not closed. So what I'm claiming is that there is a um, DC manifold on an open subset of your Alexander space. And what I am missing is certainly this set, I mean, a portion of this set over here. That's what I'm just saying. We don't have to throw it all away. We don't have to throw it all away. We're potentially actually throwing away less. Okay. And now what I'm even going to say is that you can improve this over here. And the improvement is that so you have this atlas, say u alpha phi alpha. So this one is your atlas. Right? And so now phi alpha is going from u alpha into an open subset of Rn. So here it's a phi Lipschitz homeomorphism. OK, so there is a bad set over here, omega alpha, or there is a good set, if you want, which is the image of the regular points. So the change, so the change uh, of coordinates, which is going to be something like phi beta composed phi alpha to the minus one, is in fact continuously differentiable on the image of this regular set. Okay, so this should be, yeah. Okay, and of course, okay, so this one as usual is going from uh, U alpha intersect, uh, let me see, from phi alpha of U alpha intersect U beta to phi beta of U alpha intersect U beta. And so this one is the place where I'm actually looking um, at the differential of that mass. OK, so the proof of this fact is even more sketchy, but it's based on the following lemma. And this is not in, um, in, uh, in the paper by uh, Pedelman, but it's in the paper by Ota and Chioya. 
And the lemma essentially says that in the situation in which we were before, so if you have, so if you take a place where you have your strainer and, okay, so let's, I mean, let us fix our ideas and say like, you know, B1, B2, um, and here maybe there's going to be B3 if we are in a three-dimensional space and okay, so here there's going to be uh, B4, B5, B6. So B1, B2, B3 were the ones we were giving the charts. If I take a small ball of radius delta around each of these points, and rather than uh, rather than looking at the charts, which is so before we were looking at the chart, which is x, the distance between x and b1 and the distance between x and b2 and the distance between x and p3. So if you average here, and so take the, 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 the average over the ball of radius delta centered at p1, and now you take the distance of x to b, okay, so and here you can average with respect to the Ausdorf measure that we know makes sense, okay, and make the same over here. Okay, so this new charts, which is some sort of smoothing regularization. So this new set of charts is going to have the property that the change of coordinates are differentiable on this regular set. So that's what these guys actually prove uh, uh, over there in, 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 I mean, one of the lemmas that they prove actually in their paper. So now, What was the argument of Perelman for proving the theorem over there, which I was not able to explain you except for giving you a proof if we were on a Euclidean space instead of on an Alexander space. So if you recall, the argument of Perelman was the following, that is actually so he is using as charts, um, points P1, Pn, so we use as charts, points P1, Pn, with the property that when you actually look at the angles form at the point X, okay, so all of these angles are actually bigger than pi half, plus some there, okay? And this gives you now a set of, a set of, um, a set of coordinate functions that we call them F1, Fn with the property that, roughly speaking, the scalar product between the gradient of Fi and the gradient of Fj is actually negative. So let's let's sort equal then some minus epsilon less than zero. And okay, so this if you are on a point of differentiability and you're just looking at like these um, these. Um, uh, uh, distance functions, what these gradients you might imagine they are, if you were for distance on an honest Riemannian manifold, these would exactly be the cosines of the angles which is formed by Pi and Pj at this point x. Okay, and we just said that you can actually define a notion of pointwise gradient or pointwise differential for any semi-concave function. And so now you have a bunch of semi-concave functions which have this inequality. And somehow the lemma that he proves is that if you have further another semi-concave function G, so if G is a further semi-concave function with the property that even the scalar product between gradient J and gradient Fi 
is negative. Okay, then the composition of G with the inverse of F is a DC function. In fact, it's better than a DC function, it's really a semi concave function. Okay, and now what was the further argument of, uh, of Pedelman to actually make sure that this condition is possible when I am changing charts? So if I'm looking at another chart, which is made by distance function from, so now you want to apply this, say, with some G, which is going to be, say, the GI of some other charts that you're taking, which is still the distance to some other point. So his argument is that you can actually find uh, 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 directions, so you can add distance functions into certain directions in such a way to accommodate for this condition over here. So in other words, the gradient of G will maybe not satisfy this condition over here, um, but I'm able to add to G, uh, uh, um, or to uh, better to say, to subtract from G uh, another semi-concave function, which is still a, a combination of linear combination of distance function, which makes the scalar product with this gradient Fi so negative that I can actually compensate for the eventual positivity that this one has. So it doesn't change actually any points. I would imagine that you just move. No, so I'm adding, so I'm adding these functions, and now what I'm just saying is that okay, so now I apply this to say, uh, I, I I get another set of coordinates which is going to be like g1, gn. So I would like to apply this lemma to the scalar product of gi uh, of 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 uh, to g, but the scalar product is actually wrong. So what I'm going to actually say is that I can write g subtract a function which is still semi-concave and makes this inequality. Correct. Um, okay, and okay, actually, I'm not going to subtract. Sorry, I'm going to add a function which is semi concave because I need to be semi concave. So, add a semi concave function which is going to make this inequality true. And then I apply the lemma to that semi concave function, and that semi concave function composed with F is a semi-concave function on the Euclidean space. So remember that one has a negative scalar product, so to compensate for the eventual positivity of this one. And so effectively, the idea is that if I have another system of coordinates, say G1, Gn, so he has a lemma which says that I can take G1, I can add another semi-concave function H, and now make this inequality correct. So I will know that G1 plus H composed F to the minus one is a DC function. Okay. And of course, H has, I mean, if, if, if this guy had already a, a, a negative, a negative scalar product, uh, it, it, it was not a problem. So now this one is also okay. And so even when I composed H with F to the minus one, so this one was really a semi concave function. And now, of course, here you go, you have actually written G1 as G1 plus H minus H. So I compose G1 with F, and now this one, in this path, the composition is linear. So G1 plus H composed F to the minus one is a semi-concave function. H composed to, uh, with F to the minus one is a semi-concave function. And so the composition of G1 with F is really a DC function. Do you understand the sense of the lemma is that like you have these kind of concave level sets of Fs and you need G to be, you need that angle condition to be satisfied that 
when you flatten the level sets of Fs, then you potentially only curve I, more. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to have a geometrical understanding of that. That would be great. What I can see from the silly computations I showed you last time is that even when I'm just doing this on the real line, if I don't have, I mean, when I'm applying the chain rule and computing simply secondary, but if, if I don't have the sign condition over there, I just get the wrong sign on, 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 on a term. And the wrong sign that I get on the term is on the term in which I'm composing with f to the minus one, because when I actually compose that, I mean, when I'm computing that guy, there's a an inverse of a derivative of the function f. And then when I differentiate it again, I get a minus sign because I'm differentiating one over f prime. Um, but it's a one-dimensional, it's a one-dimensional computation, and I'm not sure if I can see it at a level of higher dimensional in there. So anyway, so how does he how does he find actually this this this, this function h? Okay, to find this function h, he argues that he can find point. So because you see, I'm adding, I mean, I'm adding somehow this function h and say, maybe I want to make uh, uh, one scalar product over here less or equal than zero, but but when I'm adding, uh, a, when I'm adding this function h, maybe the scalar product with the other guys actually goes wrong. So what he's actually looking for, what he's actually finding are distance functions, which have scalar product with n minus one of them equal to zero, and very negative scalar product with, uh, 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 um, with say, the one that he wants to decrease, okay? Um, okay, ideally, it's really like, if this is direction, I mean, if this is the direction P1, right? And you want to, uh, you want to, um, so you want to actually go down and you know you want to create something which has uh, um, a gradient, a scalar product with this gradient because this gradient is pointing in this direction, right? Which is very negative. Essentially, you would like to use the strainer, I mean, the point in the strainer, which is P4 because this one has a gradient which is pointing in this direction. And so the scalar product is going to be almost minus one, right? Which is what you would like. Uh, but you have to take care to be really orthogonal to the other. And so he has a lemma which tells you that this can be produced, that it, that it can produce points which have negative scalar product with respect to B1, and they're going to have zero scalar product with the other guys. Okay. I had a question just to go yeah. back to the points where the hypothesis that this is satisfied is generically going to be what, like a straight subset of the regular points? Or... No, it's going to contain the regular points. It's going to contain the regular yes. points? Yes. The regular points are going to be in there. OK. So the epsilon kind of like allows for some. It's larger, though. Because, I mean, like, OK, so you can see that this one is kind of perturbable, right? I mean, if all I care is somehow the fact that the angles between you know, these points form certain inequality, if I wiggle the point a little bit, these are going still to be fine. OK? That is not so obvious given how convoluted the definition of the products of gradients was. Yeah, that is not so obvious. I, I, I agree with you. But um, let us just think about it in the following way. So. Um, let me just stick to the. Um, okay, I can't completely. I mean, you yeah, can't really. I realize that like the epsilon allows for a certain finite deviation from. Yes. The yes, um, but let me just think about it in the following way. If all I care is about checking, for instance, this condition on the regular points. If all I care is checking checking this condition on the regular points which I could argue is actually okay. I, I will give you an idea later why all I really care about are the regular points. 
Then really at the regular points, what I'm really seeing are like essentially the angle which is formed by this point P i x P j. And what I'm just saying is that, okay, I mean, this depends continuously on the point that I'm looking at. And so if I wiggle it in a little neighborhood, the angles are still going to be by half minus delta. True. If you switch from that geodesic to that geodesic. No, 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 no. I'm not just saying, no, I'm not. I'm wiggling only this point in the middle. Yeah, that's like, it can have to pause by geodesics to like P2. And when, when you move it a little bit, the distance function switches from this to that one. Like the level set is not smooth. And you, when you cross that ridge, like, I guess that's exactly the thing that the, the people who averaged are avoiding. Yeah. Uh, can it happen on a regular point though, what you're saying? Uh, so what was the regular? Yeah, it can be just like, if you just take a column and you your P2 is directly opposite to the vertex, when you like go a little bit to the left and to the right, you have two different <coughs> gradients. I'm not sure how we got into this discussion. So maybe. well, okay. So yeah, I mean, it's important somehow. It's important that this fact is really stable once you kind of perturb these points a little bit. That is important because because you know that I mean, but that was important even for us in the strainer thing. Like you know, we wanted that really to be a chart. So when we were actually vetting this point, what we had as a strainer, it better still be a strainer. One of the lemma say that like it's one of the lemma was saying that no. yes, one of the lemma was saying that if you are a delta strainer at that point and you wiggle the point a little bit, that set of two endpoints is still a delta strainer. Well, wasn't it because that we found instead a subregion where like a ball where it was? Not exactly neighborhood. Maybe not a neighborhood. Okay, that might be. That might be, uh, that would be good enough for our argument anyway. So I just want, you know, I just want that this condition on this, on the scalar product is going to be really correct. Not only at the particular point that are fixed at this X, but it's really going to be correct at all of it. I mean, on, on the ball around it. Yeah, I would be confused that should be like I over two minus delta. It's Sorry? I was confused about like it's pi over two minus delta. No. It's plastic. The angle has to be obtuse, really. This has to be negative. So it's not like a straight point. No, no, no. No, you can like cook it up. He has to cook up. He has to cook up the. He has to cook up the chart in such a way that this one extra condition is going to be. Correct. Does he start with a? Like a strainer, or does he cook it up separately, like just a separate construction? It's a separate construction. It's like a whole different. He's there. This one can be done. It's like a whole different chart that you construct. Like it's a different chart. I mean, it's yeah. not something which. It's not like what we were doing before with the strainer. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I wonder whether you can just argue that from a strainer, you can pick up the points and construct this condition from the, yeah. from the strainer. Because the angles are almost part, but I'm not sure about that. Well, if you are unlikely to end up at exactly a common point, so that all the angles are slightly less than. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. But this, it's, I mean, this one is something that, okay, the construction of these points is something that um, Elia, for instance, I think, has to explain in the first seminar. Because these points, which are actually obtuse, are also like the starting point of this stability, of this group of the stability theorem. 
it seems like if you just had to pick only p's like from one to n and try to decrease the distance to all of them, then you can try to flatten that whole thing. That will be maybe like now. After you've done this for these particular distance functions, then you're going to like it even less because then it says, okay, I can just simply average over the points and then I can ensure the condition even for the averages. Because now the real charts that he wants to take are not the charts, are not the charts which are given by these kind of distance functions, but in fact, he wants to average over the balls by using the Ota Shioa Shioya lemma in such a way that over these with indices. Sorry? Averaging over. Yeah, averaging over here, right? So here there's a small ball. And before your charts was going to be like, you know, the distance function from this point to that point B1. And now you are replacing this function with an average on the ball of radius delta centered on that V1. And you take the distance function to the point B. And here you use the Austoff measure. Why, why does he need to do this if he needs only DC? Now I'm going to tell you because he wants more. So he wants that your change of variables is a difference of complex function. And it is differentiable on this set, which is the image of the regular points. And why does he like this? So he likes this for the following reason. So let me just give you the upshot. So this is what he calls DC0. So DC0 is the following. So note that our maps are by Lipschitz. So if you have something, and, and, and the idea is the complement of this regular set is small. If you have something which is small dimensionally in your Alexander space, you're using Lipschitz maps. This is going to be small dimensionally even on, on, on the uh, Euclidean chart. Okay? So now here is the, this, the DC0 structure. Okay, so now you're going to ask the following. So there is a set S. So S inside your M has zero n minus one dimensional Hausdorff measure. Okay, and now your um, your DC0 structure requires that phi beta composed phi alpha to the minus one, the change of variable is a difference of convex functions. And it is continuously differentiable outside of this set. So it's a difference of convex functions. Uh, okay, by Lipschitz, let me put that as well. And continuously differentiable on the complement of this bad set S. Okay. Why? I'm going to explain you why you want this. I mean, what is the good thing of having this? Yeah, but yeah. Uh, is it possible to somehow say that like the sectional curvature is in some way a nice tensor distribution, whatever that? Measure. I'm going to explain something similar. Unfortunately, not. 
So what you can actually do now with this structure, you can define a Riemannian metric, which is um, whose coefficients are DC functions, DC zero functions in that sense. And now not really the, not really the um, sectional curvature, but the Christoffel symbols are actually measures. So the metric, I mean, the, 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 the metric itself is almost differentiable because it's, it's actually, it's not difference of complex functions, sorry. So it, it's, a, it's an algebraic formula uh, which depends on gradients of difference of complex functions. So it's products and sum of functions which have a derivative which are a measure, essentially. Okay, in fact, it's a function of bounded variation. Okay, so why do I like this condition? So I like this condition for the following reason. So um, so first of all, let me make a remark. So let me let me say that I have two functions f. Um, okay, okay, so that the, maybe maybe first of all, even before going there, let me give you an important theorem. Okay, so this is a classical theorem in geometric measure theory. So let me say just let me take a function. Uh, let me use something which is not f. Um, um, Alpha. Okay, so let me look at a function alpha from some open set omega. This one is an open set in the n dimensional space, and I'm going into R. Right? So I'm just saying alpha is a function of bounded variation. If the partial derivatives of alpha, are Radon measures. Okay. So okay, then so any H n minus one null set is a null set for these derivatives, uh, for, for, for these measures. Okay. So now remember what I told you over here. So this S as n minus one dimensional Astov measure, which is equal to zero. So my derivatives over here of the coordinate charts are continuous functions outside of S. The second derivatives are actually measured. And when you are a difference of convex functions, what actually happens is that each first partial derivative is itself a function of bounded variation. So at that point, I can take products of measures, which are the second derivatives, with expression of the first derivatives, because the expression of on the first derivatives are continuous exactly outside of a set of um, uh, uh, measure zero for the other measures. Okay, in particular, so can I ask? Yes, I'm sure I understand what you know, derivative being a random measure means. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you take you take the derivative in the sense of distributions and its action on a function phi is the action of a random measure on that function. 
So if you want the formal definition would yeah. be something like this. If I differentiate the test function uh, alpha, this is really, I mean, if I differentiate the test function phi times dxi and multiply by alpha, and here I integrate with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Okay, so here I'm integrating with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So this is really equal to minus, and then here I have the integral of phi, and then against some measure mu i. Okay, that's what I mean by having a derivative which is a valid measure. So in particular, that's what happens when you have the differential. I mean, that's what happens when you have the first derivative of a convex function, where the first derivative of, a con of the convex function is a function of bounded variation because the second derivative of the convex function is actually made by that operation. Okay, so why is this why is this important? So this is going to be important because now the the um, when I'm looking when I'm looking at functions of bounded variations which are defined on these charts. And typically we will have a lot of tensors with that property or even measures which are coming from differentiating functions of bounded variations on those charts. And so those measures or the derivative of those functions of bounded variation uh, give zero to this set S and on the complement of that set when I actually have to compute something which depends on the derivative of my uh, uh, change of variables here, I find something continuous. And so I can easily, so I can essentially justify all the, um, the calculus rules that I would commonly use on smooth functions in this context. Okay, so the upshot is. So I can define another class, which is say BV zero. And this could be, so functions of bounded variations which are bounded and continuous outside of S. And this property is invariant under composition with this change of variables. Because, see, if I have such a function f and I look at it in one chart, and then I change charts. So to change charts, I have to compose with. Um, okay, so this notion is invariant in our atlas. Okay, so say that I have, for instance, this function f and I read it on the image of some charts. Right? I mean, now, uh, uh, what is this the function f on? Uh, so the function f theta on, say, um, phi beta of u alpha. Um, OK, so, so this is going to be f theta composed with phi alpha composed with phi beta to the minus one. Okay, and that is a little lemma that you can do, which is simply saying that, okay, this F tilde now, if F is in this BV zero, this F tilde is in BV zero as well. 
And when I'm actually computing the differential, I can just use the chain rule as if everything were smooth. Okay, then lemma says if f is in BV0, then f tilde is in BV0 too. And when I'm computing, say, the derivative of this, Okay, so this guy is going to be the derivative of, the, of, of um, sorry, the derivative of f tilde, which is equal to this. So this is going to be the derivative of f Okay, I have to compose it with phi alpha composed phi beta to the minus one. Okay, this is going to be um, so I have I have I have um, so this is going to be some sort of um, Pull back. Which I need to explain, I mean, which, which for which I need to explain it to you what this exactly means. Um, and then here I'm just going to have derivatives of phi alpha composed phi beta to the minus one. And these guys, they're actually going to come to be continuous outside of this bad set S, but the important point is that that bad set S actually has measure zero for this one here. And so I can make sense of it and I can actually even do it. Okay, so first of all, when I'm doing that operation now, we encounter an important, um, an important fact. So um, so this is going to be the chain rule, and I want to understand what do I mean by composing this measure with um, that diffeomorphism. So, okay, so here, let me give you a definition. Okay, if I have a measure new, say on, on, on some set U, okay, so it's natural if I have another map, say F, which is going from U to V. Right, it's nature. It's natural to define the push forward of that measure here. Okay, so this is the push forward, which means that when I integrate a, fun a test function phi. Okay, so this over here is the integral of phi composed f d mu. Okay. Okay, but what is the operation that I actually want to define over here? So the operation that I want to define over here is really the composition. So it's some kind of pullback. It's not a push forward. It's some kind of pullback, but uh, you know, luckily this map over here is nice and invertible. So this is the push forward. If I wanted to define the pullback, what would I do? Okay, so this is going to be, this is going to look a little bit involved, 
but okay. So the pullback. So let us look at what happens when I have, say, my function. So my measure mu. So assume your measure mu is some density function. Let me call it delta times the Lebesgue measure. OK, and now, of course, I can, if I have a by Lipschitz map, I can actually produce a new measure new, and the new measure new is going to be delta composed with my function f times the Lebesgue measure. Okay. So what happens when I integrate the test function phi um, with respect to this measure new? Okay, so this is going to be equal to the integral of phi. And then I have delta composed F and then the Lebesgue measure. Okay, but now I can change variables if F is by Lipschitz. And when I change variables, I can actually write this as the integral of phi composed with F to the minus one and then delta. And then here I will have the determinant of the derivative of F to the minus one, okay? And so you recognize over here, you recognize over here that I'm doing the pullback, but I'm doing the pullback not of the original measure, but the original measure times the uh, um, Jacobian determinant of, of, of the derivative of f to the minus one. So now, so this one is the example. And here there's going to be a definition. And the definition says, so the pullback of the measure through a by sheets map phi, map f, but which has this property, which is differentiable outside of this set of measure zero. So continuously differentiable um, outside a new null set. OK, so this is the push forward. So it's the push forward through f to the minus one of the determinant of the f to the minus one um, times your measure mu. Okay, so let me just let me just give you sorry. Like if we scale it up, uh, like if the measure was just an indicator measure square of unit area, and I scale it up, it becomes an indicator measure of. Yeah, you would, yeah, it doesn't, of course, it doesn't preserve the, uh, no. oh. I mean, think about this, right? So if you have, I mean, if, okay, so like your function, function or like your function rather than measure. Yeah, your function is the indicator function of, say, a set. And now I'm composing this with a diffeomorphism. So I find the indicator function of another set. 
But of course, that indicator function of another set now I integrate is going to have the volume of the image of that set. Right? And now you understand why there's this Jacobian change of variables over there. I'm not exactly sure I'm understanding why we want it to behave like that. Uh, because that is what it would naturally happen. So this formula, right? So this formula, when I'm actually applying and I have smooth functions, that is the way it works, right? I'm taking the derivative of the function f, I'm composing with whatever is the change of variables, and then I'm multiplying by the derivative of the change of variables. Okay, so when I have a smooth function, it's behaving in that way. And now all I'm saying is that my definition is going to be consistent with what actually happens for smooth functions. Only it will work more generally if I have a measure. And in fact, let me just give you, say, a proof. So how would I go to actually prove such a formula over here? Well, it looks very natural to, because you have a function f, right? So it looks very, very natural to take the function f and, for instance, regularize it by convolution. Then I can make all of these computations. And you could even take a step further. So you regularize your function f by convolution, and you can regularize even your function that you're composing with by convolution. And then you can try to take the limit. OK? So the formula would obviously be true. The only tricky part is in passing into the limit in this expression over here. And now the way you pass into, so regularize, for instance, by convolution. OK? And then pass into the limit. OK, so now that is the tricky part. So because here you have a product of two functions, I mean, of, of, of a measure and a function. And the good thing that you know is that you have continuity outside of a set of measure 0 for this guy. So what you're going to, true, to do is the following. So first of all, when you regularize by convolution, you have a nice inequality with respect to uh, 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 the modulus of the derivative. So the first observation is that so um, null set for the f is a null set for its total variation measure. OK, but we have like. But the first term on the right is the actual derivative of matrix, not just its determinant, right? Right. So no, so this one, so this one is just going to be a product, right? I'm just defining you this guy. I'm just defining you the composition, or if you want the pullback of your measure through this guy. So you're going to apply the definition for. They call the, the, here is the measure, and here is the function that you're using, this big F. That defines you this piece. Yeah, I understand. It is just like here we only have uh, I'm a little bit cautious that here we just have functions and maps, but here we also have co vector and. Right. Okay. So of course, yeah. So of course, here I would just need to, uh, you know. So here, I would just need to um, to take, say, um, so by this I mean I'm taking the partial differentiation, the f. Okay. So if you really want the formula over here, what I really need to do is, well, okay. So this one is going to be df, uh, say, um, dy i. OK, so what I want to do over here is I want to take the f, uh, the xj. Now I'm composing with this phi alpha composed phi beta to the minus 1. 
And then here I'm just taking D, DXI, and then I take phi alpha composed phi beta to the minus one, and I take the um, J coordinates. Okay, and now I have a measure times a function and the summation over all these indices. And so now to define what is actually this composition of the measure with this diffeomorphism, I take this definition of fullback, then I've got a measure, and then I have to again define what is the multiplication with this object. And then I'm lucky again, right? So because this object is continuous, except on a set which has actually measured, measured zero for the measure. And so this multiplication somehow is univocally uh, uh, defined without having to bother about non sets of, um, of, of the measure. Okay. And so now, if I'm actually studying at this formula, right, and, and uh, what I'm just saying is that the formula is going to be correct for the regularization. So, um, first of all, a null set for the derivative is a null set for each uh, a total variation measure. And when you have, I mean, when you are actually, so this is a convex um, taking, say, the modulus of df, which is taking its total variation. So, if you want to take the radical negative decomposition, and then you have a Positive uh, and non-negative radon measure times a Borel function, which is telling you the direction, and then you take the modules of that. So that operation is convex. So when you're actually taking a regularization by convolution, you have a simple inequality, right? So you you have this inequality over here. Okay. And so now what you're going to use is you're going to argue in the following way. So uh, let me, okay, so let me regularize this guy and let me regularize the map I compose with, okay? So now the regularization of the map I compose with because of continuity converges pointwise outside of the bad set. But once it converges pointwise, I use uh, Yegorov's theorem and I can actually say, well, it actually converges uniformly after I throw away a set of small measure. Now, the set of small measure that I'm throwing away, it's going to be a set of small measure even for the derivative of the regularization because of this inequality. So I have a small error, and then outside of that, I have measures which are converging weakly in the sense of measures and continuous functions which are, which are converging uniformly. So I take the product and I can pass into the limit. I make a small error, which depends on what was the set that I threw away. So I get this identity up to a small error, and then I let the error go to zero, and I actually get the net. Okay, so now, once you got this kind of chain rule, if you want, Now you've got your chain rule for uh, BD zero functions. Okay, now for instance, I can um, define what are the covariant tensors. Okay, so the covariant tensor I actually pull back, right? So let's say a covariant tensor is going to be for me just something that I write in the following way. Right, but I need actually compatibility conditions between the charts. So the compatibility conditions for 
we look like this, right? So if I were so with compatibility conditions, okay. So the compatibility condition would um, be in the following way. So if I have a change of variables in the new charts, if everything were smooth, I would see this expression. And so, this ugly expression over here is the components of my tensors in this basis in the new chart. Okay? And now I'm just telling you the following. So, if so, these are now functions which are continuous outside of this kind of exceptional set S. And these guys over here, they are allowed to be either functions of bounded variation in this BV0, or they are allowed to be actually Radon measure, which have this bad set S as an offset. And so here I have the pullback of the measure as I defined it. And here I have just a multiplication by this by these functions, which happen to be continuous, except for the bad set. Of these coefficients, and so that's that's the way I define. So we want to look at things that are regular on the yes. irregular. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. And now I can do the same for contravariant tensor, but actually, for contravariant tensor is um, sort of even better, right? So let me just do it. For instance, for vector pins. And then you can do it for contravariant tensors. Okay. So now here, um, say I have, for instance, X, uh, the tensor, and I'm looking at the chart, say, beta. And this is going to be xi beta d dxi. And OK, so now if I look at the new chart, say y alpha, well, OK, so here I need to do the push forward. So this one is going to be xi beta composed with f to the minus 1. And then I have dfj dxi composed f to the minus 1. And then here I have the so these are the rule for my coefficients y alpha i. And now here I'm just going to say exactly the same as before. So OK, these ones are good functions. These ones are actually allowed to be measured. And now you see that now if I'm actually push forwarding, in which case the operation with the measure is actually nicer. Now you see that the definition of pullback, so this would be the pullback of this measure, but through this map f to the minus 1. So it's essentially like push forwarding the measure through f. So it's consistent with the notion of push forward of the measure, in fact, at this level. OK, and now the upshot is the following. So as long as, 
So as long as you can make any computation, so um, as long as you can justify a say first order computation in the smooth category and your tensors have the correct structure, then you can actually justify it in this category. So let's say your tensors are BB0 or M0. And so by this, I mean a BD function, which is continuous outside of the bed set or a measure for which the bed set is not set. So then the same conclusions apply. Okay, with a star. So there's a little twist. So there's one thing which we potentially don't like. And the one thing which we potentially don't like is that when we are carrying on computations by inverting differentials and using change of variables in a chart and so on, when we are in the smooth category, the determinant of the, the Jacobian determinant of the change of variable, say on a connected component, is a constant. So it's either one if the orientation of the two charts is, 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 is compatible, or it's minus one if I'm flipping the, ori the orientation with the chart. So, can you repeat? so I mean, if I if I give you an atlas, right, yeah. and you have two balls which are overlapping, okay. So now they say there are two balls overlapping and they overlap now in a nice set. Okay, so now the change of variables that I am using on that chart is either orientation preserving or orientation reversing. So the Jacobian determinant is going to have a sign, which is either positive or negative. And so when in that definition of pullback or push pullback of the measure, I put actually a modulus, you actually know that there's no modulus. It's either going to be without modulus because it is orientation preserving, or it's going to be with a negative sign with a minus because it's orientation reversing. Okay, but there's no modulus. Okay, so here there's a little lemma. And the little lemma says that even for these charts, the sign of the determinant is actually constant on any connected component. Okay, so, so let u alpha phi alpha be a DC zero atlas. Okay, then. So the determinant of the Jacobian determinant uh, so of the differential of phi beta composed phi alpha to the minus one does not change sign. On connected components, of, um, okay, so this one is defined on phi alpha of u beta. Okay, now I'm pretty sure you don't need to use the theory of functions of bounded variation to prove this. I mean, there must be a simple topological argument which is telling you that, but it's pretty fast with the theory of functions of bounded variations. And the reason is the following. So because so because so because you are by Lipschitz over here. Okay, so certainly what you know is that 
this Jacobian determinant the modulus is bounded away from zero. Okay, that's rather simple. Now, this guy is the poor a function of bounded variation, which is taking only the values one and minus one, and which is continuous outside of a set of n minus two, uh, uh, I mean, of, of, of n minus one measures. Okay, so now you, you take your pick. So you could say it, fo it follows, for instance, from the Georgie's regularity for, so, so now you, you, you take the set where this function is equal to one, that is what is called the Cachopoli set, set of finite perimeter. Now you can take the Georgie's theorem, which tells you, well, the measure theoretic boundary of this set is a rectifiable set. And if this condition is equal to zero, it means actually the perimeter is empty. So the set is either the entire connected component or the non-set. So you can use like, the Georgi's theorem. Can you just say that like if any line intersects the boundaries and like- Yeah, another one, thing that- is just Exactly. Like, another thing that you can actually do, you can do it by hands and you can, you can for instance say something like this, okay? So like, like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's an argument which, that's an argument which works. A set which has, you could even argue in this, in this way, a set which has n minus one measure zero cannot disconnect your, um, your, um, your set, um, your connected set. And you're actually continuous on the, on, 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 on the, on the complement. So you can even just use that, okay? So there's lots of structure that you can use. So um, in the paper, Ambrosio is just, and, 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 and the collaborator is just using Cachopoli sets. But it holds more in general. So in, in, in the paper, actually, they're defining these functions of bounded variations with the zero in a slightly more general fashion, because you don't really need continuity outside of this uh, bad set. You need an approximate version of continuity. I mean, if you have lab back points, which is what general BD functions would have, except for or where they jump, that would be enough. Okay, so now with all of this in place, what I'm telling you now next is the following. So first of all, you can go back, um, take the, the paper by Ota and Chioya and define a Riemannian metric. So this Riemannian metric will be the BV0 will have BV zero coefficients. And you'll be able to use this theory to define covariant differentiations, in particular, Eschams of functions, Laplacians of functions, and like, you know, what is the covariant derivative of the test? Okay, so what do they do over there? So over there, they just do the theorem that so there is a um, okay. So let me just say this one plus Perelman. So there is a Riemannian. Two tensor GIJ which is BV zero in this structure.
and induces the metric structure of M, of the Alexander space. Or if you want, the distance in the Alexander space is the geodesic distance for this Riemannian structure. Okay, so that's a whole paper just to prove this. So let me just give you the idea on how you define this metric. Okay, so let us go back to kind of the original charts. So I have my old strainer. Okay, and my chart over here was, for instance, if I am in two dimension, and this is the point X, my chart was X P1 and X P2, okay? Now, what do I know about this chart, which would make me suspect that I'm actually able to guess what is the Riemannian metric that I want to put? Okay, so if I am at the point of, the, of differentiability for the distance function, right? I know that the gradient is the direction, I mean, in the, in the, in the set of direction at the point X is the direction pointing towards P1. And I know that the gradient at the point X for the distance function from P2 is this direction over here. Right? Sorry, are, are we in a regular point or is this just like epsilon? We are in a uh, we are in a regular point, first of all. And on top of that, I'm even I'm, I'm even assuming that the function is just classically differentiable over here. Which, you know, in, in technical terms, it would say I'm avoiding the cut locus of the distance function. Which is anyway kind of a set of measures in, right? Okay, so now what is the scalar plot? So what is G of the gradient of the distance function to P1 and the gradient of the distance function to P2? Well, it's the cosine of this angle, right? Which I actually know. I mean, that's what the metric structure is telling me. So now, in general, if I have one such chart, I can put a metric on that. I mean, I, I can define a, a, a matrix on that, which is just the scalar products, I mean, the purely scalar products of all these gradients, which are going to give me these cosines of these angles, right? So I can define this gap. Okay, what is that guy if we were on a classical Riemannian manifold? That guy is the metric on the cotangent bundle. Right? Because, so think about now having like coordinates x1, xn. So what I'm computing is g of gradient xi, gradient xj, but what is g of gradient xi computed on any vector v? Well, computed on any vector v is nothing but the xi of v. And so computed on a vector v, which is one of the um, um, coordinate vector fields well this one is of course dxi computed on dxj but these forms are exactly the dual of those vector fields so this one is exactly delta ij 
right? And so out of this obvious observation, you can guess that that matrix over there, so you can just say, okay, so now G, I, J, what is going to be? Well, I take that matrix over there, which I know how to compute. Okay, and then I take the inverse of it. Okay, so this is my metric tensor on the um, uh, tangent bundle. Okay, and now why is this going to have? Uh, okay, so first, this this of course is if you um, if you are um, if you are taking uh, uh, these guys over there, right? But okay, so if I have an average, right? So now, if my say coordinates. So my coordinates now are these averages, right, that I found before. Okay, so now once again, what do I need to define? I need to define the scalar product between the gradients of two coordinate functions. And okay, I can just make the guess that the gradient is going to like uh, commute with the uh, with the uh, average. Um, the um, scalar product has to be bilinear, and so I have now a double average. And now I see all these angles which are formed at the point X by the geodesics which are coming from V i and V j. Okay, and that is going to uh, to be my guess for say gij. So gij is going to look like this. So it's going to be the average. And here I have the ball of radius uh, p1. So here pi. Here I'm going to have the average, and here the ball of radius pj. Okay, and now I'm going just to take the angle. And so here is the angle which is made by a geodesic px say p prime and now i am and i have to take the cosine of that mm -hmm. and then i am differentiating in p and differentiating in p prime and uh, i'm sort of like we wrote this cosine just because we knew because the function was defined as a distance function that it was like unit length in it but when we average it it becomes not unit length, so it is. No, well, okay, but I'm just saying the following, right? That if you give me, um, yeah, okay. I mean, you give yeah, me a, a measure and and vector fields. I mean, it's bilinear, right? I'm just using linearity of the integral and linearity of the form. Okay, and so now what I need to check is that it's going to have this BV zero character, but you see that by construction, what I'm going to do, so okay, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a cosine and then I'm taking an angle which is formed by the gradient of the semi-concave function with the gradient of another semi-concave function. So you can imagine that out of the semi-concavity of the distance functions, this is going to be a BV zero function. So BV zero and semi B of the distance functions, continuity, well, that's what actually Shioya and Hot and Hot have to do. So this continuity on the regular set. So 
for those. Okay, so just let me mention one last thing. Okay, so the covariant derivative of a uh, so the covariant derivative of tensors. Okay, so for the covariant derivative of tensors, you have to um, well, if so, if the Riemannian manifold. Um, so it's smooth, right? So let's, for instance, say that you have a vector field X, um, which is of the form Xi d d x i. So how would you define the covariant? So, so what is the formula for the covariant derivative? So the formula for the covariant derivatives in the direction Y, where y is another vector field x. Um, um, okay, so this is okay. So let me just try to write it down in coordinates, right? So this is d scale j x i d d x i um, and then I tensor with xj okay and then that is the Christoffel symbol right so the Christoffel symbol should read like something like this so I have gamma k Get this correct. So, should be I. so this should be J. Um, so this should be DDXK, and then you have the tensor. The x i. Okay, and um, so now if you have a vector field x, which is a vector field of bounded variation, you know what to do with this guy, right? So this guy is going to be a measure, and you can compute it. And now you have this quantity over here that you want to compute too. And so now if x j is a BV zero function, so fun a vector field of bounded variation, which is continuous outside of this set. To make sure that this thing is defined, you need actually this guy here to be a measure um, for which uh, the bet set has measure zero. Okay? And well, you have a formula for the classical Christoffel symbols once you have the components of the metric tensor. And you just have to check that um, this formula is now going to give you uh, what you wanted.
Okay, and upshot is, well, again, this is a function of bounded variation and it's because it's the inverse of the metric and it's going to be continuous outside of the bad set. And here you have derivatives of these coefficients and if these coefficients have derivatives which are measured so that the bad set has measured zero, that's exactly the assumptions over which you are. So, and that's what you want from, from, from this metric. I have a sort of naive question. Um, mm -hmm. what, what stops us from continuing the analogy and saying, well, the curvature tensor is a ah, distribution? When you are computing the curvature tensors, look at the formulas. You have products of the Christophe symbols with themselves. When you're looking at the Riemannian tensor, the actual formula is going to give you some derivative of that gamma aij, but then there's the product of measures. And now you are in trouble. So because like you want to define the product of two objects, which you don't know how to do that. So that's where I think if you if you want to try to mimic this like you know coordinates point of view, you're running into uh, serious troubles. Right. So you can't you can't push it um, you can't push it forward than than, than this. What I do know is, um, but maybe Elia has an idea here. If um, if at the level of the Ricci tensor, you can somewhat use this metric, this Riemannian metric, and, 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 and kind of justify that at least the Ricci tensor is giving you some sort of correct object. And the reason why I'm saying this is because the Ricci tensor, so the, 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 the curvature tensor has to do with kind of, you know, the deviation of geodesics point-wise. Whereas if you look at the uh, Ricci tensor, it has more to do with um, the deviation of the, um, of the volume of the sphere uh, in, in, in directions. And somehow it's a nicer quantity because you can average it over it and maybe you can do more computations that you wouldn't be able to do it when you're trying to look at the components of the Riemann tensor. Right. But that's definitely where it stops. It's good enough, though, to define, for instance, the Hessian of a function. So now if I have a same iPhone K function, I can take the gradient. The gradient is going to be, again, a function in this BB0 class. I mean, assuming the same iPhone K functions doesn't have kinks. And then there is a vector field which is in the class that I can covariantly differentiate, and so I get the Hessian. And that gives me a concept of Laplacian and, uh, and so on. To like, uh, you want a nice uh, question in here, and I don't know if this is, uh, but this might be answered somewhere in the literature. So, Petrunin has a notion of parallel transport, which is just geometric. That is what is uh, cited by Perelman. Well, now here you have in the charts a notion of uh, what should be the covariant derivative, and so the natural question is whether. Uh, Petrunin's parallel transport is actually equivalent to say that the covariant derivative of um, whatever the vector field is equal to zero in some directions. Right? So, but 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 it's uh, okay. So it's somewhat delicate because this covariant derivative is a measure, and so I don't know exactly how you um, you know because if you want to parallel transport say a, a vector field along a single geodesic, then you really have something which you want to understand. Just point points of that genetic, which is a relatively thin set. So I don't know how the two uh, concepts relate uh, to each other. And uh, there's no comment on the. Um, you said there's nothing in the literature. But... I've not seen a comment in uh, in um, so in in, in so Perelman is citing Petrunin's parallel transport at a different point. 
in some argument. I didn't see him citing it later on and say, okay, like, you know, you define this covariant differentiation and how does it compare to the parallel transport of this? And I, I, don't, I didn't see that in, uh, in uh, Ambrosio's uh, paper. But like you said, mm -hmm. that's more of like a point by statement. So. Yeah, I'm just saying it's not obvious to me from. But then you said that, that if we are avoiding non regular sets, then we should work fine. I'm not completely sure because. I mean, yeah, if I'm avoiding on the non regular set, but 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 there's always this. Okay, there's always this. So this guy is a measure, right? So if, if I want to understand what it means for this measure to, I mean, like a, a line for this measure, like kind of vanishes. So I can't really think about the measure, right? I have to restrict the measure on that line. So I don't know, maybe I can fiber with a two. Yeah, I think like if your line, the compact thing is entirely in a regular set, then picking arbitrarily small neighborhood, you can make arbitrarily by Lipschitz close to one charts. Um, yeah, but it, but it needs some work somehow. You're assuming that uh, the S, the set S here is this. Because just nothing or? Okay, so if I were, if I were to, okay, so say if this one, okay, if this one is a regular function, right? Just an honest function. How do I recover the value, say, on a line? Well, I would take a tubular neighborhood and I would just average over it, find it, right? But then I have to average. When I'm averaging, I'm like dividing by the size of the cross section. Now, if this one is a measure just on that tube and I'm dividing by the size of the cross section, that thing is maybe going to infinity. So I'm not completely sure how I want to extract the limit to say that, you know. Yeah. But my point is just like intuition tries to hint me at that if we are only in regular set, then any pathological behavior should go to zero as we restrict our neighborhood. Because, zero. because like, um, like for any epsilon in our uh, G built uh, business, we can find a neighborhood that does not intersect points that we throw out. No, that, we that, are in that, that, intersection. that I am okay. I mean, that one is, but it's not the first. I'm, I'm not saying that I pre I'm presenting any argument. I'm just saying that it looks like it should be. So, but there's another. So, there's another set which I'm just slightly worried about, and the other set is the following. So, this guy is really a measure, and it's made by an absolutely continuous part and something which is more fractal. And one set with, that worries me is the set where this guy is singular but not absolutely continuous. Yeah, but it looks like just a problem of like if you pick bad coordinates, then you would have trouble. Doing competitions in that coordinates, but okay, okay. The point is that you you can pick better and better coordinates. Okay, okay, okay. If it is a, uh, uh, it's true that concept. Okay, that object is not intrinsic, so maybe there's a system of coordinates in which it gets better. Like, I'm good. not saying that there are even like. I'm not saying that I expect anything more than just ex existence of trivialization along that curve. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be. That could be. That could be that you get a better and better system of coordinates, and somehow these gammas maybe they uh, behave in a nicer way. Could be. But if I, for example, pass through a vertex of a cone, then yeah, yeah. Like, how do I parallel transport across that? It doesn't look like I should expect it to be there. Yeah. Okay, so um, then we see each other in two weeks.